we start recording it actually. <laughs> um, and it's gonna be an hour panel discussion um, and a 30 minute Q&A at the end. Uh, we're gonna be discussing uh, barriers to wilderness medicine. Oh, the, the wilderness medicine survey that actually Mariko will, will tell you about. Yes, I just posted a link um, in the chat to everybody. Um, the Wilderness Medicine Society has a diversity, equity, inclusion um, committee, and we created a survey to actually kind of hear from everyone who attended this panel, anyone who's in wilderness medicine or wants to be in wilderness medicine about what are the barriers to wilderness medicine. I'll post this again later on, but um, after this panel, if you wouldn't mind filling this out, it would be really helpful. And then we just have a couple etiquette reminders. Um, please make sure you are muted unless you are asking a question during the Q&A. Um, and we want to invite you to leave your video on just for engagement purposes and also to give the panelists a chance to see who they're speaking to. Um, if you have any questions, please leave them in the chat box and please make sure to direct them um, if there's a specific person you'd like to ask, one of the panelists. Um, and we'll go ahead and collect those and save them for the end. Uh, we also have some acknowledgement and intention setting we'd like to do before we get started. Um, as event organizers, we need to acknowledge our privilege and limited perspectives as Asian Americans. Our intention for organizing this panel um, is because we have felt that the outdoor spaces we've recreated in are predominantly white spaces and that wilderness medicine is similar, if not even more niche and less diverse. We also want to acknowledge and thank all of the BIPOC organizers who taught us and inspired Jenny and I. And we really want to thank our panelists and um, they have just been so generous with their times and the preparation and to just share their stories and experiences and get this conversation going. Um, we also want to uh, acknowledge though that this event has its limitations because it does not and it will not be able to represent all of the views um, and perspectives of marginalized communities and individuals. Um, so with that, we encourage all of you who are attending to remain open to what the panelists have to say. And I believe that our presence tonight is an indication that we share a unifying desire to make this world a better place. And so I thank you for, um, for being here. So with that, we're gonna start out with some introductions. Um, first is Dr. Rupal Unia. Rupal is an Indian Canadian movement disorders and stroke trained neurologist practicing in Maine. She enjoys hiking with her dog, rock and ice climbing, road and mountain biking, skiing and ice skating. She became involved in wilderness medicine through the application of unrelenting peer pressure by good friends. She's done some volunteering in low resource settings in Haiti and Zambia and is the de facto trip doctor for trip adventures with her climbing friends. She's working on her fellowship for the Academy of Wilderness Medicine and is the current chair of the Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee of the Wilderness Medical Society. Next is Rachel Sapp. All right, Rachel is an international adoptee brought to the United States from Chile. Over the past 12 years, Rachel has been blending professional roles in emergency medicine, climbing guiding, mountain rescue and outdoor leadership. Currently, she is an EMS advanced life support provider bridging to registered nurse, a cert certified rope rescue technician, and is a candidate both for a diploma in mountain medicine and the fellowship in the Academy of Wilderness Medicine. Rachel is the owner and founder of Backcountry Pulse, a philanthropic oriented wilderness medicine education company that uniquely integrates tools for rescuer and mental health and works to break barriers to education. And next is Vanessa Castro. Vanessa is a Mexican and Asian American critical care physician assistant based out of Colorado with over 12 years of professional experience. Her journey into austere medicine began after volunteering with the comprehensive disaster relief services immediately following the devastating earthquake in Haiti. Vanessa has completed her diploma in mountain medicine and is currently a candidate for the fellowship of the Academy of Wilderness Medicine. During her free time, she enjoys teaching wilderness medicine with backcountry pulse, rock, ice, and alpine climbing. 
Right, Elise Salomone. Elise was born in Puerto Rico, raised in Connecticut. She is a 27 year retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel and Army veteran. She practiced military medicine as a woman's health nurse practitioner when deployed to Afghanistan and during a mission in rural Mexico. Since retiring from the Air Force, she has continued to be an advocate, public speaker, mentor, and coach for women, veterans, and Latinx communities. Her favorite outdoor pastime is hiking. And finally um, is Dr. Avinash Patil. Avi is an Indian American assistant professor in emergency medicine at Stanford University School of Medicine. He is a whitewater rafting guide, former manager with Outdoor Adventures UC Davis and medical director of Outward Bound, Racing the Planet, Sierra Rescue, Athenian School and Ripcord Travel Protection. Dr. Patil's passion in the outdoors is for water in all phases, whitewater, snowboarding, sailing and surfing. And so I'm going to uh, stop sharing our, my screen here um, so that we can focus on the faces of the, the panelists while they answer. Um, the first question, and we'll start with, um, with uh, Dr. Unia, um, is uh, tell us about your background and journey into wilderness medicine. Sure. So my family wasn't really a outdoors type of family. Um, you know, we did a little bit of car camping here and there, um, but it wasn't until I was in medical school uh, and I was, I was actually, I attended medical school in Poland um, that my friends uh, coerced me into going on hiking adventures with them. And pretty much every time we would nearly die. Uh, but uh, one of those good friends uh, became involved in wilderness medicine. She uh, is a snowboarder and rock climber and, and does all of the things, surfer. Uh, um, so she kept trying to convince me, maybe five years of trying to convince me to do this. Uh, and then I met some more people who were also involved in wilderness medicine. And so, you know, when the conglomeration of peer pressure happens, you, um, that, that combined with finally making money uh, helped to um, allow me to, to become more involved. Um, but it was still one of those things where it was a friend of mine's organizing a, a conference and uh, for the students, Wilderness Medi Medical Student uh, Conference and said, I know you're not a student anymore, but you should really come to this thing. So that was my first foray into, into really getting into wilderness medicine. Um, but I did discover that it doesn't matter how much you know about wilderness medicine, if you're a doctor, they will expect you to know what you're doing. Um, you know, there's only so many times I can say, okay, I, you know, that's not my body part. I don't know what to do before you just have to uh, learn more about it. All right, thank you so much. Um, I wanna direct this question now to Rachel. Hi. So um, I, I'm going to get real vulnerable with you guys, <laughs> with everyone. Um, so I had a pretty unconventional start into wilderness medicine. And one that I always say um, kind of formed out of a place of grief and healing. Um, with my personal experience as an adoptee, I always say that I lost one family, but I was lucky enough to be adopted into two. Um, growing up, I lived across the street from my aunt and uncle who are like second parents to me. And when I was in high school, my uncle uh, died of a brain tumor. And then a few years later, my, uh, my aunt died unexpectedly of a stroke. Um, during this time, I went through a really traumatic life event and it led to me getting PTSD. Um, up until that point of my life, I had always been a musician. And um, when I was dealing with these traumas, I just took an EMT course on a whim and at the time, I remember hitting enroll and not really being sure of what I was doing enrolling in this. Um, I think I was seeking for some sort of resolve or healing, and I thought I could find that in helping um, helping others that were in vulnerable situations. And what I didn't expect is to find this passion and this love um, from being in this community um, and dealing with the things that I would see on um, 
on EMT calls. And it caused me to kind of dig deeper into it. And through that, I found mountain rescue, which I also found climbing and discovered this culmination of passion for both outdoor education and wilderness medicine. And I think once I found that, I just kind of never looked back. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. All right, let's direct this question to Vanessa. Yeah, so after I finished um, school, I had several opportunities to work um, at volunteer medical clinics with less resources. And I really enjoyed the challenge. I really enjoyed the experience. Um, I feel like it helped me become a better clinician and just kind of thinking outside of the box. And then uh, yeah, in 2010, I, I was able to go to Haiti um, like a few days after the earthquake, and um, that was really life-changing for me, um, practicing austere medicine in those conditions and just um, seeing, how, uh, you know, what a benefit um, it is to have uh, kind of all hands on deck in a situation like that. Um, and then from there, I started um, looking for more resources and guidelines with regards to how to practice um, austere medicine um, outside of, you know, the U.S. and international borders and in remote environments. And that's when I was introduced to Wilderness Medical Society, who has guidelines um, on exactly this. Um, and then later in my personal life, just being more active in the outdoors, I seem to be like this black cloud of like running into catastrophes in the backcountry, and um, and ended up pursuing a, a diploma in mountain medicine um, and further training. Um, and I realized that backcountry was also a an arena in which I could help um, practice safety and mindfulness and. Um, encourage safe enjoyment of the outdoors. And that's when I started uh, teaching with uh, that country pulse. Thank you so much. Um, Elise, it's your turn. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a 27 year military veteran. And for those of you that don't know the military, um, austere medicine is what we do. And uh, uh, especially being uh, deployed to combat zones. And um, I have the least exciting outdoor uh, passion, which is hiking and uh, something that I do whenever I travel. And uh, that's really it. I mean, I just, you know, Rachel asked me to participate and here I am and hopefully we can all gain some value from our conversations today. Thank you. All right, Avi. Yeah, thanks, Mariko. Um, so I, you know, I grew up first generation American um, and like most first generation Americans, like money is really to be spent on education and not really uh, the outdoors or recreation. And, you know, we were very poor growing up, but um, my parents were sugarcane farmers in India. And so we grew up very at ease with the earth. We grew up like growing everything we eat, always outside. We didn't have a TV. Um, and I think that's sort of like where my outdoor sort of experience started from. And in college, uh, you know, I went to UC Davis, which is pretty close to the Sierras and started getting in more into skiing and mountain biking and uh, started working as a whitewater rafting guide. And really medicine wasn't on my, in my future at that point. I was studied developmental economics and thought I would live abroad working for an NGO and sort of started taking first aid classes, wilderness first aid, wilderness EMT, um, swift water rescue classes. And that sort of sparked my interest in, me in medicine and sort of um, led me to do emergency medicine. And I did a fellowship in global health and then now work in global health and wilderness medicine, doing like a various kind of various projects here and there, but also doing a lot of expedition medicine and event medicine, uh, as well as I still work as a whitewater rafting guide in the Grand Canyon. So. And we see your beautiful background. Yes. The Grand Canyon. With the favorite. iconic <laughs> pictures of the Grand Canyon. <laughs> awesome. So we're going to start with the next question. Um, what does wilderness and or austere medicine mean to you? Um, and we'll go back to Dr. Anita. So for me, um, I mean, wilderness and austere medicine is just practicing in resource poor settings. So whether that's 
you know, working in Haiti or if that's working in the middle of the woods where you have nothing uh, to use. I mean, those are all, the, I think you can apply the same skills to all those environments. Uh, you really have to know, as my residency program or director used to like to say, you have to know how to practice neurology without a, you know, in a power outage. And so this is kind of the, the skills that you apply when you're in those settings. Uh, you kind of have to be a little more creative, a little more in inventive, and you encounter things that you're not going to encounter in your safe home setting. Uh, and so um, I just love learning about, you know, jellyfish stings and shark bites and things that, yes, you don't really encounter in everyday uh, life, but that are fascinating. And next, uh, we'll go to Rachel. Hello. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I look wilderness medicine, I feel like at its core is, um, you know, the complexity of caring either for yourself or others in environments where we we just have limited communication, um, resources, but we have extended patient care time. Um, and I, for me, I like to think of the comparisons between wilderness medicine, um, and public health in areas of marginalized communities or public health in areas where we have low resources. One of a comparison and kind of draw to this is what we've been dealing with with COVID. Um, we've had a lot of situations where our healthcare systems have been overwhelmed. Um, we have run out of ventilators, we have run out of space in our ICUs, um, and we've been forced to kind of say, well, what can we do without all of these labs, without all of these resources? And I think a lot of times we're drawing back to these skills um, that we're using in austere medicine. And I think there's a place for wilderness medicine um, in everyday life. Thank you, Rachel. Um, and next, Vanessa. Uh, yeah, so wilderness austere medicine to me is kind of like um, like a very vulnerable place. I, for my day job, I work in the critical care unit and here we have like all the resources that you need, all the medications, all the um, staff specialties and subspecialties and we take a person who's really ill and very decompensated and we can actually quite seamlessly and easily kind of get them back together. Um, so austere wilderness medicine is kind of the opposite where you have a problem that's seemingly like minor um, and no resources um, and a very vulnerable position. Um, and it, it just makes things all that more difficult. Um, something as simple as, uh, you know, like, hypothermia or hypoglycemia, it becomes kind of an epic. Um, and so for me, I like to focus a lot on prevention um, and education in wilderness medicine because of that. Thank you, Vanessa. Elise? I need to leave this on mute. Uh, you know, a lot of the teachings that we have in the military um, are for us to learn how to take care of each other when we are out um, in austere environments. So really using your critical thinking skills and um, using things that are in your environment to splint you know, a broken leg or a broken arm, um, using a belt for a sling are the things that we learned uh, throughout our military career. And that just kind of takes it back to even the civilian sector if you're hiking or doing something on the outdoors. But I think it's, it's using those critical thinking skills um, and also making sure you're not panicking so that you can keep everyone calm and, uh, and just you know, try to use those skills to be innovative and creative to get that person to the next hierarchy or level of care that you can as quickly as possible. Thank you, Dr. Patil. Yeah, thanks. Um, I echo kind of what everyone else said um, without having to repeat you know, everyone else's thoughts. I think of Kind of wilderness in theory is this great equalizer you know like um the trees don't know you know anything more about you the animals don't know like who's white or who's brown um and i know what kind of wilderness experiences gave to me it totally changed my life it changed the traje tra trajectory of my educational path my career path and 
I think of wilderness medicine as a way to extend those experiences to other people to kind of get them out there in a very safe way and also to allow people who are medically challenged to get out there. Um, so, which is part of my, part of how my, why my career sort of evolved with working with organizations like Outward Bound, really using my wilderness medicine skills to help people have those same wilderness experiences that brought me so much uh, joy in my life. The other thing that I really think wilderness medicine does for me personally is it just adds a whole dimension to my career. I think that medicine is like so challenging and um, can be pretty, the, the, the daily grind of medicine of seeing patients, writing charts um, can really lead to burnout. So to me, wilderness medicine has sort of combined this, kind of these two aspects of my life, this wilderness experience as well as this medical experience. And I think it's added a lot of longevity to my career. Thank you so much for to all the panelists. And these questions are really helpful. and for all of us to get you to know better, know you better. Um, kind of want to start transitioning here to get uh, and ask questions, I think for the reason that we're all here is to talk about diversity, equity, inclusion. But first I kind of want to bring it back to this question is, uh, ha have you had any experiences that have made you uncomfortable as a person of color? And if you've had, how have you dealt with these situations? How have you how, how have you coped with them? How did you handle them? And actually, I'm going to bring it back to you, Avi. I'm going to put you almost uh, put you out there to, to answer yeah. the question first. Thank you. Um, you know, I think not in almost every wilderness activity I do, I'm usually the only person of color. And um, my outdoor community is pretty awesome. Like, I've never felt uncomfortable. I've never felt like any sort of um, feeling like I didn't belong there the experience that I've had in route to those activities. So, um, you know, I've guided river trips all over the Western US and most river trips and national parks and so forth are really close to pretty rural conservative communities where there are usually no people that look like me. And actually I've had some pretty terrible experiences in like bars and small towns. And, um, you know, like I've had people blame me for 9-11 at a bar, I've had people, um, I spilled a beer on a, on a bar one time and somebody told me they're going to call immigration on me. Things like that have been really my kind of main sort of wilderness racist experiences. Um, but my particular community um, has been pretty amazing. I mean, I think I, I had a lot of experiences, you know, in my early 20s where instead of a whitewater guide, people would call me like the brown water guide, which didn't bother me actually at all. It was sort of like a term of endearment. Um, but it was sort of in these rural settings where I felt sort of, I grew up in the Bay Area, very diverse. And I never, you know, the sort of attack on the color of my skin, which is this real, like the largest part of my identity externally, um, really kind of hit me, took me for like, a, I, didn't, I didn't know how to answer. I didn't know how to respond in my early twenties. You know, I was too young, I think to come up with sort of like a, a good response. And I think the way I deal with now is I just call people out on racism. Like I, it doesn't bother me anymore. I have nothing to lose. Um, I don't have that same sort of like need for, I need to fit in in this place where I'm the only person of color. So I just don't uh, I handle things very differently now than I did uh, in my early twenties. Thank you so much for that answer. Okay, let's have Rachel. Do you wanna give it a shot? So it's an interesting question for me. Um, I, so I've grown up with an interesting sense of identity. Um, I think being adopted, I've always felt like I've um, straggled this line of where do I belong? Um, I was, I came from one culture and was transplanted into another. Um, and so I grew up with an American family, but was from Chile and I've, always just had this, um, I never quite feel like I fit in <laughs> in any group anywhere. And so it's kind of like a everyday experience for me of like worried that, um, you know, I, how will people interpret my intentions because I have grown up with this culture um, that's not a culture that I was born into. And so 
it's an interesting question. Um, and for me, I, I haven't experienced, um, cause I, I, I'm a white passing, um, Latina. And so I think that that is something that, um, is always been interesting for me. Um, and my biggest areas of places where I haven't quite felt like seen or heard has always been when people question intentions. So when, for example, when I started um, Backcountry Pulse, one of my biggest passions was how do we create inclusive spaces in wilderness medicine? And that was kind of my headstrong, like I am excited to go out and figure out this. Like how do we create, you know, this space for everyone? And a lot of times my intention for it was like, well, wait, hold on. Someone who looks like you shouldn't be talking about this. So it was always coming from this, I had to defend myself or my background. Um, and so it's kind of an interesting pendulum. So it's not really like feeling like I've been um, not, you know, I haven't been discriminated by my identity, but I've been, I think there's a sense of confidence that I have to have with my identity um, to just feel okay in that space. Thank you. All right, RuPaul. I don't think I've experienced specifically racism in the wilderness myself, um, but when I um, first became involved with the Wilderness Medical Society and I started going to conferences, I began to notice that there were not very many people that looked like me. And you know, there are a lot of brown doctors out there. I mean, quite a number. So it was strange that there was only a couple of us at this conference and everyone else was white. Uh, and so that's when I really started digging into this question of why is that? Um, what's going on here? It's, it, we're not representing the, the population we're coming from. So, um, but in terms of uh, experiences just within medicine itself, rather than just in the, rather than in the wilderness, um, people are always commenting on my skin color. I mean, like, where are you from? Well, I'm from Nova Scotia. Oh, you don't look like you're from Nova Scotia. You have the wrong color hair. So <laughs> I've have, I've lived plenty of those kind of stories, and and so I don't think that that gets limited to you know the the hospital or the office setting. I think that's probably present everywhere. It's just a matter of who you're interacting with. So. All right. Thank you, uh, Vanessa. Yeah, um, my experience in wilderness backcountry um, is, yeah, I, I don't think I've been, uh, I haven't noticed any discrimination because of my race. Um, certainly when I lived and worked in, um, in Tennessee, it was like a weekly basis in the hospital where I had to kind of attest to me being American and uh, being not foreign and you know, other parts of my intersectionality that people question is if I was old enough to practice medicine and, and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, in the back country, um, I, I think that maybe if anything, I've been more aware of the fact that I'm like female and um, maybe there's some um, kind of, I perceive people to uh, expect less of me because of that. And I think I have a tendency to kind of maybe want to overcompensate and prove something. And that's really when I just kind of have to jot it in and, and just remember to be exactly who I am without puffing myself up. Great. And Elise, last but not least. You know, this is this question kind of like made me think, I'm trying to think of all the times I've gone hiking all around the world, if there was any particular incident. And it's funny, I went hiking in Mount Rainier um, a few months ago with a friend of mine. And as always, as everyone else, some of, the, some of you have mentioned is I'm usually the only brown person around. Uh, the thing that I find interesting is that um, I grew up in Bridgeport, Connecticut, where, you know, Puerto Ricans were, were running rampant around there. But um, 
I, I was, we were always the only Puerto Rican kids, but we were surrounded by our community that was all multinational. And um, I don't really necessarily carry myself in a way that I think about um, diversity and inclusion until very recently when I really started realizing that this was an issue and some of the things that have gone on. But one thing that I found interesting on that hike was that um, my girlfriend that was hiking with me, she was Asian and people would say hi to her but never said anything to me. And I found that really interesting. I actually didn't realize until just now when we were talking about this question. Um, I think a lot of people are, um, they don't even realize their biases. And uh, I think that's, this is why this conversation and these panels are, are important to kind of talk about it because I think that many people don't even realize what biases they have um, until they're actually faced with them. Thank you so much. Um, so I think we're gonna go ahead and move on to uh, the next question, um, which is um, what it what was it like to enter a field where you did not see people who were like you or shared your intersectionalities? Um, kind of going off of what you have all already shared. Um, and I'll go ahead and, and um, start with, Elise, again, if you want to continue on with that one. Yes, hold on one second. My internet's unstable, but hopefully you guys can hear me all. <laughs> um, again, I'm just going to say, even in the military where we are extremely diverse organization, I am generally only the, the only Latina no matter where I go. So this is just something that I've learned to deal with. And um, I don't know, I just try to represent, you know, and try to win people over with um, my compassion and sincerity and the level of expertise that I have and uh, just move on from there. Um, you know, we need to have the conversations um, and trust me, I've had plenty of uh, situations where um, I am questioned and uh, for many different reasons, not just being a woman, but being Hispanic. Um, I just try to deal with it at that point and, um, you know, it's, it's just an interesting dynamic when you're in your mid fifties and you tend, generally tend to be the only person of color in situations that I find myself in almost on a daily basis. So I don't know if that answers the question, but it's just, it's just kind of part of who I am because it, it just happens all the time. And I sometimes, to be honest with you, I don't even really realize it until we start doing these panels and these conversations. And then I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, there was that situation. So... <laughs> So thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask um, Vanessa if you'd like to share as well. Yeah, yeah, I'd say um, being in, ex in those experiences have been intimidating at first. Um, and uh, I think the older I get, um, the more I try to just kind of focus on myself and, and how I'm going to behave. and what I'm going to bring. And certainly, yeah, living in the Southern US for five years had, has made me better at that, of being a very obvious minority. Um, so my experience has been one of intimidation, but is getting better. And I've also learned how to kind of um, pick up like subtleties in people's behaviors that could be encouraging to me. And so like a smile example or just kind of kindness from someone that may look different um, has gone a long way with me. Okay, and next, um, Dr. Ania. So in terms of feeling uncomfortable in the wilderness settings, not so much, just because I usually am there with a group of friends. And so I am, I belong there because I'm with them and they invited me and we're going together. Um, you know, while I'm there, my, my insecurity would be more so, you know, related to my physical ability or like I'm shorter than everybody. So I can't, you know, do all the same climbs or, um, I can't hike as fast and, and those sorts of things. So more so related to my physical ability. Um, but when I've been going to wilderness medical 
conferences, um, it's really awkward if you don't know anybody and you're just like there trying to mill around and meet people. And, um, and so, you know, one experience I had was that some other women kind of took me under their wing and they're like, oh, you should come and sit with us and we'll become friends. And so that was, uh, I, I think the really nice experience I had with um, finding a place uh, but it, it this wasn't really, I don't think, related to to race so much as just not knowing people. Thank you. Um, Rachel. So for me, I would say it's um, it's motivating. Um, I think that, um, I've always been one to question why the things um, ever since a child and my mom jokes that my inquisitiveness is my least enticing feature. Um, and I think with every challenge um, or every uh, disparity, you see there's always opportunity and I think there's always room for growth and learning. And so um, that's always kind of been my uh, point of view is, well, why do we see this and what can we do to change? What can we do to grow and to learn? Um, and so that's kind of where my point of view always goes to. Um, and Dr. Patel? Yeah, um, I, for me, in sort of outdoor settings, the way I think it sort of manifested of not having other people who look like me there is that oftentimes I feel like I'm people underestimate my ability because let's say there's a, a rescue on the river. The tallest, biggest white male is always looked at as the person who can handle the problem. And by far, I'm usually the person with the most experience on any river trip that I'm on now. I've been guiding for 20 something years. I'm a physician. You know, it's sort of the same thing, like if a female answers the call on an airplane, is there a doctor on the airplane? Like, you know, the female is not looked at as the doctor it could be, you know, kind of the same thing. I think that I've had park, like National Park Service in the Grand Canyon, like not talk to me, even though I'm the trip leader um, and talk to like, you know, a customer on the trip or uh, as the guide or, um, that's sort of how it's, I think, manifested for me. But again, like Rupal in my immediate community, I don't ever feel any sort of discrimination because they're, these, these are my community, people who I've chosen to spend time with. Um, so in that respect, I've never really felt any discrimination just on a personal level, but I think oftentimes as a person of color, we're viewed as not the person who sort of quote unquote belongs there. Thank you so much. Um, I kind of want to transition the conversation a little bit um, to kind of talk about these more nebulous issues, just, you know, from your perspective, what do you see? Maybe this is not, I mean, share from your personal perspective, but your thoughts on the issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice in austere and wilderness medicine. So we're going to, we're kind of transitioning this question towards our discussion towards roles and responsibilities and then how can we move forward. But again, the question is, what if any, what if any issues do you see about DEI in wilderness or austere medicine? So let's get started with Vanessa. Yeah, so I guess, um, you know, in backcountry recreation in general, there's uh, you know, lack of accessibility, particularly for minorities who tend to live in more urban areas. And I think that extends as well to wilderness medicine. Um, so I think that there's also kind of lack of mentorship um, as well, which being outdoors, like doing kind of advanced activities require a certain degree of mentorship. And that's all dependent on your kind of circle of friends and your kind of um, acquaintances. Um, and then kind of the other privileges, you know, time and money 
um, which a lot of times prevent um, people, particularly people that uh, are minorities and um, may have different socioeconomic pictures than an average uh, non-minority member will have difficulty kind of accessing the outdoors in general. Um, and then I, I think there's just kind of like this uh, culture of like privilege, particularly here in Colorado, where like if you're like the newbie and you don't have the right gear um, and uh, yeah, yeah, you look different than the average like mountaineer, like let's say you're a slight female, um, then there's a little bit of like, like shaming towards that. Um, and so, so yeah, I think the challenges are just kind of accepting people, um, uh, you know, as they are um, promoting more access and then also like mentoring people um, would be the ways to get around that challenge. Great. Um, Rachel, do you want to hop on to that at all? Sorry, my mute button. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I completely agree with, um, with what Vanessa was talking about. I think that just overarching um, challenges are access. I think access is a big one. Um, and then also just representation as a whole. There's this uh, quote that a dear friend shared with me um, by Dr. Crystal Jones. And she says, there's a huge difference between all are welcome and this place was created with you in mind. And I think that's something that can really apply to our spaces in wilderness medicine. I think that um, we see what's possible by looking at who's held roles previously. Um, I think we can look at, for example, the history of our Bryce presidents and we see, you know, older white males in these roles. And now people are seeing that it is possible. There is now a female, you know, woman of color vice president. And now these little girls are looking up and saying, this is something that is tangible and it's possible for me. And sometimes it's hard to visualize this unless we have an example to follow. And I think that that's kind of like a, a micro scale, but on a large scale with wilderness medicine, um, we just don't have a lot of good representation. Um, and I think that, you know, specifically to BIPOC communities and even, you know, extending past that individuals of all ability levels, um, individuals of that share all different intersectionalities and identities, we need to be able to see that represented to think that that's possible, that there is a space for us. Um, and we need to adapt kind of the way that we're looking at wilderness medicine, um, both through education, both, both through practice um, and seeing how we can make this space a lot more inclusive. Okay. Who am I gonna pick on next? RuPaul. So it's interesting because in this pandemic era, um, there's so much more accessibility to things that people couldn't do before um, because everything's on Zoom now. So uh, people from all around the world are now participating in the Wilderness Medical Society conferences and uh, we've seen a dramatic change in the demographic just because of that uh, ability. And so I think um, it's, it's kind of our, our starting point, but it's really uh, encouraging uh, sign. And I think our opportunity just to just capitalize on, um, on COVID as it were, uh, to, to be able to introduce uh, wilderness medicals, uh, wilderness medicine to uh, groups of people that would not otherwise have been able to uh, participate or even be aware that this is, and, and I think for me, awareness is a big um, uh, barrier for a lot of people. It's just that this is, they don't, it's not in their field of view. This isn't something that they have seen other people do, and it's not something that they have considered. So I think uh, that is, the other piece of it. Thank you. Elise, I saw you shaking, nodding your head a lot. So do you want to want to go next? 
Yeah, I, this is such a great conversation. Uh, I think I, you know, there's so much to say about accessibility and responsibility. And, and I'll give you an example. Um, a few years ago, my son, who is 30 now, uh, has epilepsy. And we went to Canada and we were up at Whistler and we were going up on this, um, uh, on this um, I'm having blanking out, but one of those, those ski, um, Oh my gosh, I'm like totally losing my mind. But anyways, we were going up on this hiking trail and the people that were sharing the, um, the gondola with us uh, were just really like, um, gondola, thank you, thank you, I finally got it. <laughs> but they, uh, they were literally looking at what we were wearing and just breaking down why we were dressed inappropriately. And it's like, it, we were totally dressed appropriately. And, uh, and when we got off the gondola, my son was so upset. And I was like, just let it go. Let's just go for a hike. And it wasn't like we were doing anything crazy because um, we were kind of high altitude and I was a little nervous that it would um, potentially be a trigger for him. So I was being even more careful than, than that. And at one point he actually got really out of breath and I was like, okay, sit down. And I started having a little panic attack. I was like, oh my God, if he has a seizure out here, we are screwed. Um, so just those, even those things that I'm a medical professional and, you know, just going to do a little vacation and having, having the access to do something that was fun and it's supposed to be beautiful in nature. And then you have people that are sitting there like, you know, literally breaking down what we were wearing, how inappropriate it was. And it makes you not want to go and do that kind of stuff when you don't feel like uh, there's other people that look like you or that had that representation um, out there. And I'm not even someone that even really thinks like that, but that was like, when you guys were talking, that kind of like brought to mind that one particular incident and, uh, and how JJ just didn't even want to, he was so turned off by Canadians at that point. And I'm like, well, let's, let's not. And there was another whole incident on the border, but that's another whole long story. But yeah, so it's just to think accessibility and having the representation that is so, so important. Um, for those of us that grew up in urban areas that really don't know that there's a hiking trail 10 minutes away and you could just go up there and you don't need to have any special hiking boots to go to go do that event. Um, and I think that's where, you know, talking to the younger generation and getting those populations out there is, is really a, some work that we need to do. That was a great answer. I could listen to your <laughs> stories all day long. Perhaps another time. <laughs> all right, Avi, you're last. Yeah. Um... Were we we're talking about the, like the responsibility of other organizations, right? Was that the original question? We're I, I was alluding to like that being like the next question, but the current question was, what issues in general do you see with DEIJ and wilderness medicine? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm echoing like everything, you know, what everyone else said. Um, I think that we do need to sort of hold people responsible for accessibility. I mean, I think that I think individual citizens have some responsibility of like taking advantage of these outdoor spaces, but I think that we do need to hold sort of the government um, for redlining and not having urban space, you know, parks and urban spaces. I think that we need to hold the National Park Service accountable for ignoring the stories of the native tribes that lived in these lands, but focusing on John Muir and uh, focusing on the people who quote unquote discovered um, you know, not really discovered, but sort of explored these parks. Um, should we hold like, you know, the North Face and Mountain Hardware for not having, you know, I'm, I'm not blaming them at all because I think they do a good job these days about having people of color in their ads. But, um, you know, I think all these, uh, there are, there's a lot to be accountable for by other organizations that I think have some responsibility in like increasing access to uh, outdoor spaces in the wilderness. Well, I, I kind of want to bridge onto that because you started talking about the role and responsibilities of organizations, um, companies. Um, so let's get started on that, that discussion. Um, let's have, let's have Rupal get started on this question. Does that sound good? Sounds good to me. Okay. So, I mean, in terms of various organizations, that should take responsibility for this. I mean, for me, the number one is the Wilderness Medical Society. That's the major one that I'm involved in. 
Um, and I think um, that we have been, I mean, our committee has been meeting since December and trying to come up with ways to really connect with our communities and say, how can we get uh, more people of color of various different backgrounds uh, involved? Um, and so, I mean, it's up to us to really make it happen. Other, I mean, people aren't going to necessarily come out of the woodwork to come find us. And so we have to go find them um, to say, this is where you should be. This is a really cool thing that you're missing out on. And we really want you here. We need you here. We need your uh, experience, your expertise, your uh, different experiences. And, uh, and so as the Wilderness Medical Society, I mean, we are trying to take responsibility for that. I think we've got a long way to go. Um, but there are plenty of organizations that are uh, working on improving the diversity in the wilderness setting itself, and which is wonderful. I mean, I when I was living in New York City for a year, I volunteered with this uh, organization called um, ICO, which is Inspiring Connections Outdoors, where we would just take kids who have never been out of their little neighborhood, have never seen a green space and just take them, you know, like an hour or, you know, half an hour north. Um, and so they could go on a little hike or go ice skating or, or see something other than um, their concrete block. Uh, so I think those starting, we've talked about this before, a few of us, but starting them young is uh, the best way to go about it. Thank you. Uh, any roles or responsibilities for professional organizations? Yeah, absolutely. So outdoor companies leading with like more inclusive and representative marketing, which I've actually kind of, I feel like I've seen a lot more recently, like Mountain Hardware and Outdoor Research. Um, and also um, like Outdoor Retailer this year did a few sessions on inclusivity, which I thought was really cool. Um, I also saw in the American College of emergency physicians, they wrote an article about, or my friend David Young wrote a little piece about um, being homosexual in the wilderness medicine world. And I thought it was really cool for, um, for that society to, um, to highlight his experience. Um, so yeah, I think that companies and organizations do have a role in kind of representing a more diverse group. Um, and then I recently had the opportunity to um, go to Mexico and work with this group called Escalando Fronteras, which means climbing borders. And they take um, kids that are uh, at risk for joining gangs and they take them rock climbing in, in Monterey, which is like beautiful rock climbing, um, for example. And if any of you guys want information on that group, they're a wonderful nonprofit. Um, but really just kind of like letting everyone enjoy the outdoor spaces that we all benefit so much from. Great. All right, uh, Rachel, any insights? Yeah, so I, um, I wanna talk on a couple things. I'm gonna try and condense it um, <laughs> as much as possible. Um, I think there's a couple different things that we need to think about with this. And I think um, one is how are we defining recreation? I think that's number one um, because recreation means a lot to a lot of different people. And so I think when we think, oh, it's only recreation if we're climbing mountains or doing something more extreme versus is it recreation? Is that still recreation if we just wanna have a picnic at a national park um, with our family? And so I think broadening that definition is one thing that just as an industry, we need to really think about how we're defining it. Cause I think that that limits access just from what's the you know presentation of how we're talking about recreation. Um, and I think number two, as far as wilderness medicine education specifically, I think that we do such a good job talking about technical skills. Like that is kind of the core of wilderness medicine education, um, but we don't do as good of a job talking about interpersonal skills. And I think that that's something that we can really work and grow on as an industry. I think having a more holistic view of patient care, because the patient isn't just their injury or illness, it's them as their core, as their whole 
people, their identity, their intersectionality. And I think bringing that into wilderness medicine classrooms is really important. Um, I think addressing issues like how do we assess somebody um, of different skin tones? You know, how are we working with people of different cultures? You know, every patient comes with their own trauma, their own background, their own way that we want to be, you know, they want to be addressed. And I think finding ways that we don't just rush through a lot of these patient assessments, but ways that we really build that trust and rapport and figuring out how we do that from an educational as well as a healthcare provider standpoint, um, is gonna be really important for the growth. That was an excellent answer. Thank you so much. All right, at least I saw your head bobbing again, so I'm gonna pick on you. <laughs> I think I'm just going to let Rachel talk because she says it all so beautifully, you know, and it's like, how do you, how do you add any more to that and except, you know, to say, uh, to caveat on the holistic nature of, med of healthcare medicine and, and not just in the wilderness, but, you know, even, even in the emergency rooms where, um, you know, we focus on an injury and not necessarily the whole person. Um, there's so much to be said for that. Uh, and I can go on a tangent on that, but I won't. Um, I already forgot what the question was. I'm sorry. It's Friday. <laughs> the question was about roles and responsibilities of professional organizations. Uh, um, I think, you know, we have to include education that includes what our communities look like. And it just can't be based on whatever bias of, um, of the core educators. Um, for example, if you're in a community that's mostly white and you're doing, uh, you're doing education and you're not considering that these students or educators or healthcare providers are going out to communities outside of where they're living and they're gonna have to deal with patients that are Hispanic, African-American, Asian or whatever, then you're doing a great disservice to that, to that future um, provider because they're not gonna know how to assess uh, someone for hypothermia when um, they don't necessarily may look blue, they may look a little bit more purplish, you know? So just so those kind of things, um, I think that when we talk about diversity, it really starts in the classroom and it starts in our, in our communities. And, and that's such a huge issue that I, I honestly, I know that one person can make a big difference, but I think it's gonna take, it's gonna take a, a real big movement for all of us as healthcare providers to, um, and educators to change that. Thanks so much, all of you for sharing. Um, so we're gonna start to, to wrap it up a little bit as it is 6.05. And after this question, I think we'll move on to, to Q&A. Um, and so this question is about, you know, what, um, what kind of future you would like to see in wilderness medicine and, and or austere medicine and um, what kinds of challenges you see in getting there. And um, I'll go back to um, Dr. Patel. Um. I mean, I think the, for me, I think the future would be not seeing like a brown or black person in the wilderness in any setting and being surprised by it. You know, like um, I think that is sort of like where I think the future should be. Um, like yeah. nobody really cares what they look like. Um, and I think my sort of argument on why this is an important topic is that, you know, the demographic of the country is changing. Right, and I think it's like in 20 or 25 years, the population will be less than 50% white. The demographic of our legislatures are changing, like people who are making laws to protect the spaces that we love, the demographic is totally changing. We see more people of color, more women, you know, we see this sort of changing demographic. And to me, the only way to get people to preserve these spaces and to be engaged in the wilderness is to provide them these sort of experiences that give them this visceral reaction to the wilderness that's gonna engage them and make them want to save this space. So to me, I think the future is engaging these people, whether, you know, the people who are gonna be the stewards of these spaces for the future, which I think is gonna be demographically more diverse just by nature of the demographic of the country is changing. And as far as wilderness medicine goes, we see the demographic of medicine changing 
Um, not as much as I think it should, but it's pretty significantly different in the last like 20 to 25 years. Um, and I think if we're gonna engage sort of the leaders of tomorrow for the Wilderness Medical Society and not just physicians, I mean, nurses, PAs, everybody, I just know the data for physicians. Um, I think that we need to engage those people in the wilderness. Uh, thank you. And um, Rachel, can I go to you next? Yeah, I think that um, I, I mean, speaking in sort of like a dream perfect sense, it would, you know, be a place that um, we're encompassing all identities. Um, I think I really liked uh, Dr. Patel's um, previous comment where he was talking about the trees don't know <laughs> um, mm -hmm. who you are. The mountain doesn't know who you are. Everybody's treated in this, you know, vulnerable way in the wilderness. Um, and um, the reality is that, unfortunately, as human beings, we're never going to have that viewpoint. There's always going to be blinders. There's always, you know, things that we're bringing into spaces um, or carry through life. Like we all have privileges in our own way. We all have blinders in others. And um, the recognition is really important. Um, but I would like to think that we could have a future of wilderness medicine that one accepts and addresses all of those issues, one that is encompassing and says, yes, we see this, but here's how we work towards it and we make it better. And I think that panels like this, um, conversations like this is how we get this started. Um, and I think as long as we always feel like we have work to do, we're doing the right thing. <laughs> um, I think if we ever get complacent as an industry or with anything it's kind of when um it's kind of when things just don't really go as planned it's kind of like being in the wilderness where they say as soon as you get complacent is when you get injured I think that that uh that same type of mentality is um a way that we can view just our learning and growing with wilderness medicine as a whole thank you Rachel um and Dr. Nia. Can you repeat the question for me, Jenny? Yeah, so in thinking about the sort of future you would like to see in wilderness medicine and, and um, what sorts of challenges you see in, in getting there. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I really agree with what everyone said. I would love to see um, the people in wilderness medicine reflect the people that are in the community um, so that there is representation of that uh, kind of equally. Um, one of the areas where I think we're really lacking is representation of indigenous people, uh, of native people. Um, and I mean, this is my personal opinion, but I think they should be overrepresented because this is their land, you know? Like we're just kind of squatting here. So um, so I think that's gonna be a, a personal challenge that I'm taking on as that I wanna form that relationship um, and really encourage people to, to come into this community. Uh, and yeah, representation is really important, but I, I, like I said earlier, I think awareness is one of the big uh, barriers, but there's, it's, a, it's a whole conglomeration of factors, um, financial and social access, uh, access the gear. Um, there's so many different things that play into it, but um, I think by creating personal connections with people, uh, we can really uh, work towards making our wilderness medical community more diverse and inclusive um, just by the virtue of uh, really bringing it down to that um, level of, of interpersonal connection rather than just looking at it from a, a more um, bird's eye view. 
That's interesting. Thank you. Um, Elise, would you like to go next? Am I on mute? Okay. Um, you know, one thing that while I'm listening to everyone, I was thinking about this, you know, the call, the, the call to action that I have for everyone that's participating in this is that if you go for a hike or you go rafting or you go mountain climbing is to reach back to your community and find someone that may not have the opportunity to access that event, but that you can at least maybe introduce them to it and then spread the word about whatever uh, wilderness medicine education you have and teach small classes in your community, um, teach your, your, your family, because I think the more that you do the storytelling and get people involved, that those are small imprints that can lead to a global movement where more people get exposed to these um, opportunities of recreation. And like Rachel said, I think it was you that said, you know, let's define what recreation is because it can mean a million things to a lot of different people. Um, and if you're involved in these roles where you can potentially impact your community by just doing teaching some classes or, or bringing somebody along that you know may be interested in mountain climbing but doesn't even know where to start and then just teach them, you know. Um, I know that my friends think I'm crazy because I love to hike and I can do it any time of the year and uh, finding someone to do it with is usually my challenge because my family doesn't necessarily like doing it with me. So that's another thing, but, you know, find other people that you could potentially, even if it's kids, I mean, kids spend so much screen time. It's like, let's get them outdoors. Um, there is a healing power to nature and being outdoors. And I think that, you know, whatever we can do to help our communities, even if it's one or two people in your local circle of influence, I think that that can really make a big difference. Thank you, Elise. I can't ag agree with that more, the power of, of healing in nature. Um, and then finally, um, Vanessa, I want to give you an opportunity to answer that too. Yeah, just to echo kind of what Rupal and Elise have said, uh, more representation is needed. Like broadly speaking, we want to um, see the population kind of mirrored in, in like the healthcare profession and especially in wilderness medicine. Um, I think there have been several studies on, on compassion um, and empathy and, and a medical perspective and how that leads to better patient outcomes and reduce pain, reduce anxiety. Um, and we tend to be more compassionate towards people that look like us from an evolutionary background, like we're more sympathetic, empathetic towards our members of the same tribe. Um, and so until we can get accurate representation in these fields, um, what we can do is, um, you know, what's called perspective taking, which is kind of putting yourself in the other person's shoes and trying to imagine how you would feel if you were a person that maybe didn't speak the native language or looked very different or was from a different socioeconomic class. Um, so I think for now, that's kind of a, a way around um, working through the, the lack of representation, um, which is so important in, in these like intense fields where you're kind of putting your life on the line in, in wilderness medicine where compassion, compassion and empathy go uh, a long way. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you again to all the panelists who have shared so much with us today. Um, there was a question in the chat about a recording. There will be a recording that is going to be posted on PNW Med and we'll send out an email um, that has a link to the recording for everyone who, who registered for the event. Um, and I, I wanna open up the floor to questions. If there's anyone who would like to um, ask a question, um, can throw that in the, um, the chat box or um, feel free to unmute yourself and speak up. Hi, uh, my name is Deborah East and I'm the admissions manager for wilderness medicine at Knowles. And I just wanted to offer an affirmation to the things that panelists have said about outreach. And if you have created um, an initial offering where you have centered the people that you're offering to in it rather than just making it welcome, but they're centered in it. Um, there's a, a specific example I would give. Uh, it took about, I would say, two years of collaboration um, that was very well worth it. Uh, 
I'm in Lander, which is near the Wind River Indian Reservation, where the Northern Arapaho people and Eastern Shoshone people are on their own unceded land as a reservation. And um, in the long stretch of the time, it was really about five years, but it came about because tribal members came and wanted to learn wilderness medicine. And we always wanted to be ready for, to say yes, that we were gonna do that even if there was some challenge happening. Um, and we didn't have many challenges. And so because that was needed for specific things and because there was one person that uh, was also a former graduate of the Knowles Expedition Course who really wanted to have the wilderness first aid training for the people that were working with youth. And over that period of time of meeting every month, just getting to know each other, just working and being diligent about that and building relationship and building accountability, uh, showing up when we said we would. Um, uh, we ended up after that period of time providing a, a fully granted wilderness first aid course that provided um, a specific amount of uh, underwriting for that training. And there was a cross section of people, all tribal members in different professions, game and fish, police department, youth service folks who got their wilderness first aid training. And also uh, subsequently, and during that time, people have taken their wilderness first responder training and they've also taken, w taken WEMT training. So. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but I also want to make sure we get to the other questions. So I wanted to circle back and ask uh, ask you your original question. Was it about outreach? It was about outreach when you center folks, and I was okay. just done, so this is fine to to stop. Okay, thank you. My apologies. I just want to make sure that we get to some other questions. So if any one of the panelists want to speak to centering. Um, individuals of marginalized identities in outreach and in, um, I'm, I'm guessing, programs. Um, whoever wants to get started, take the floor, please. So I guess I can speak to how it doesn't work. Uh, I mean, how it doesn't work if you don't center people. If you just say, oh, here's a thing that you could do We'll offer you a discount, um, which is one of the things that the Women's Medical Society did for the uh, conference, previous conference. They offered a discount to certain groups um, that were like, for instance, the Brotherhood, um, who are skiers, um, a group of black skiers uh, and other such organizations to say, you know, you should come to our conference. Um, but without that, I think that without that personal connection, without forming the relationship, there's not as much of a, um, I'm losing the word, but there, there just isn't that impetus to, to come do something that you wouldn't have otherwise done without that, I, without feeling like you are the focus. Well, you know, people don't want to be the token brown person in an organization or the token brown, um, you know, team or whatever, because, you know, this organization wants diversity and inclusion, but they really haven't done the work in the background. You know, it's mm -hmm. the same thing with veteran organizations or vet or organizations that want to, you know, we, we take care of veterans and we support veterans, but then when you actually get in there, they really don't. They just want that to be um, uh, for attention grabbing or to get people on there but when you get into those organizations they really don't know one they don't want to get to know what the veteran experience is or what the transition experience is or how they really don't want to know how they could help that veteran in whatever uh whatever their service line or product is and it's and it's the same thing with you know your organization okay so we give you a discount for this conference and we and we want your group to be here but why do you want us to be here why is this important why should we care why do we need to be there what are we going to get out of it what's that added value and where are those interpersonal relations that you know that we want to make a difference and we want to hear about your experience um so i think yeah that's that's pretty powerful right there. Do any other panelists have, have thoughts on that topic? If not, I'll, I'll move on to the next question. I 
Actually, I was thinking, I saw Rachel on mute, but I also was wanting to oh, pick yeah. on Rachel when it comes to the search and rescue question, because I know you got involved with search and rescue. So would you want to answer both of those questions? Yeah, so I wanted to, I unmuted because I wanted to make a comment. Um, um, the diversity is often an advertising buzzword. And I thought that that went hand in hand with the search and rescue question. So um, even though it was a comment, <laughs> um, I wanted to say that that's, it's really tough. I think when we think of companies in the outdoor industry, like we're seeing a lot of um, push to, you know, have, you know, how companies are now basically putting a magnifying glass to their um, their own company and saying, okay, how can we create, um, how can we make something that was first, you know, maybe not as accessible and make it more um, attainable to others. So like I'm specifically talking about products or gear, that kind of thing. Um, and I think that what we see, unfortunately, is a lot of brands that um, basically get a couple of black or brown ambassadors and then you know highlight those on social media but then the work isn't really done internally through all of the processes it's like oh here's a glorified photo that we can kind of put out there but then when you actually look at the structure of a company or the things that are in place it's like maybe they have somebody in that position but it's this one person in this position trying to overturn this entire systemic company and I think that that exact model is kind of what we're challenged with with search and rescue agencies as well I think it goes back to all of those issues of access um, all of the issues of representation and I think that there's nothing more important than forming relationships with communities. I think that that's where it's kind of a really good starting point. Um, it's, we're aware that a lot of leaders and companies, a lot of people that are making those higher level decisions are not, you know, people from marginalized communities. And I think that being okay with you know, taking a step back and saying, I don't have all the answers. I don't know exactly what to do. And who are the people that I can reach out to or that are my resources? Who are the individuals that can help, you know, steer or guide me? Um, one kind of plug I want to put out there is Teresa Baker um, and her team have been doing a phenomenal job with the CEO Outdoor Pledge or the and I think that that is a really good spot. You don't have to be, you know, ahead of a company, but I do think search and rescue agencies could really benefit for some of the work um, that their team has been putting out. And I do think that um, allyship, yep, that's a great, uh, great comment, Elise. Allyship is so important. And I think that we just can't be we have to kind of put aside the awkwardness or the worry of how we're going to come across and just, you know, these are the things that I don't know. Here are the areas that I want to grow. Where can I find these resources? And then building systems and revamping things that are already in place to get there. Hopefully that answers. I wanted to talk a little bit about allyship versus sponsorship. So, you know, think about this, like if you're in a company and you have someone that's really mentoring you and helping you get to the next level in your career. The problem is that could be an ally and that could be a mentor. But if that person is actually not looking for opportunities and putting your name in those opportunities for advancement or for programs or projects that you may be um, more than qualified for, then that allyship may not necessarily be moving you forward to the goal that you're trying to meet, whether it's in diversity and inclusion or your next promotion. So it's, it's having those people that are in the levels of power in the organizations that can really make a difference for them to have the ability to look at their organizations and say, you know what, I know that we need to improve on our diversity and inclusion, and this is how we're gonna do it. But then actually, once you get those people that are diverse in your companies, not just putting them in a corner, but actually hearing their voices and really getting them involved so that they can continue to progress in the organization and that you continue to sponsor them through um, through their careers uh, instead of just putting them on a corner. Because like, I think somebody said diversity is a, it's a catchword right now, but the problem is diversity. Okay, you get that person of color in your company, 
and they may have been the best qualified, but then once they get there, they may not feel comfortable or have someone that actually sponsors them to continue to do the work that needs to be get done in that organization or company. Does anybody else wanna comment on that um, question about allyship or sponsorship or speak about either of those things? If not, we do also have some more questions rolling in. Okay, so I saw one of the questions, Cindy, thanks for asking this. To any of the panelists, how have you explained or justified to either youth or elders in your communities about the value of engaging in the outdoors or using wilderness medicine? I can tackle this one for a bit. Um, you know, I think there's other countries for years have been prescribing sort of outdoor activity for, um, and probably in Japan, I think maybe has like the most data on this as sort of engaging in outdoor activity and many markers of um, improved health, blood pressure, high, you know, like um, stress levels, anxiety, like psychiatric and medical diseases. And I think it's a like a win-win, you know, I think going in the outdoors, we know is like a healthier, um, people are just generally healthier when they engage in outdoor activity, uh, both with like diet, exercise. Um, so I think like for me is like, and like the WMS is like, we're all kind of healthcare providers. I think it's um, a real easy justification for just improving your overall health by engaging in the outdoors. For the veteran community right now, and actually in the last probably 10, 15 years, there are actually a lot of programs that are geared towards um, uh, service members that uh, suffer from PTSD and actually getting them outdoors. And the, the miracle of that healing of being in nature and getting these um, service members off medication and um, actually moving forward in healing because of their outdoor activities. And there's tons of programs out there um, and research on that as well. Um, for, I can't remember who asked the question about getting the elders and the youth in, interested in wilderness medicine. I, I think if you're in that space, start with your own family and start with your own communities and expose them to that and, you know, have a call of action to, you know, get those kids off that screen time and let's get them outdoors. And even the same things with, um, you know, with our elders, let's get them outside and walking and, and of course take into consideration whatever their limitations are. But um, I think is it's getting our, our whole country back outside and uh, get them outside the home and get them off their screens. That is, it's a challenge for, for all of us, not just, um, you know, not just in the diversity, uh, in the diverse community, but for um, our, our whole country. Can I add a twist to this plug? <laughs> um, so Elise brought up um, the outdoors being um, this incredibly healing space and talking about veterans with PTSD. And I also wanted to acknowledge here um, the outdoor educators um, that are present because I think often with um, medical providers, um, we have a somewhat of a shield, not saying that it's a full shield, but we do understand that when we go to work or when we're in these situations that we're gonna see things that are gonna be pretty difficult. Um, and, you know, healing is something that is extremely important and, you know, figuring out how to deal with the traumas that you see as a healthcare provider. But I think on that same lens for outdoor educators, we're accustomed to saying, hey, we're taking you out and we're gonna give you this really empowering experience. Um, and we don't always have the tools as outdoor educators or the shield um, that something bad might happen. And so I think that while the outdoors is an extremely healing place, it can also be a place that can um, that we can experience unexpected events, um, things that are tragedies. And now this wonderful activity that we go on for fun is now a place that's reminding us of a trauma or something that we experienced. So I think with that, I think it's also important um, that we kind of address the mental health piece um, with all of this. And I think that that 
I mean, it expands to all communities, but I do think that that's just something that I just wanted to throw in as we're talking about the outdoors being a healing place, that it's also a place that um, we need to have just as good risk management um, for just like we're saying, you know, help your ankles, help all of these things preventatively. We need to also have that preventative approach um, with mental health. And I just wanted to just quickly just jab that in there as we were on that topic of outdoors and healing. <laughs> Would anyone else like to add on there? I don't know that I do a really good a job of explaining this to my family members because they all just think I'm wacky. Um, you know, when I told my mother about this diversity, equity, and inclusion committee of the Wilderness Medical Society, she's like, oh, well, you just like to do weird things. So um, I would say <laughs> that it can be challenging to, to have other people see the value in what you value, but um, you can't let that stop you. Uh, and then some people will just think you're wacky and you just smile and move on. I think when we're finding our peeps and our tribe, we just need to kind of bring at least one or two new people along with us just to kind of try to increase that community. Remember, I agree with you. My, my family thinks I'm nuts half of the time, but that's okay. <laughs> Well, it is 6.33. Um, I wanted to offer, I want to offer some and make some space for if any of the panelists want to give some concluding thoughts at all so that we can take away. I know that's kind of a, be, it can be a bit intimidating, but if anyone wants to offer their concluding thoughts, otherwise um, I think we're going to wrap up in the next two minutes or so. I just want to echo what Elisa said like a few times, you know, I think that kind of the outdoors, you know, no one's going to, this isn't like a legislation top down effort. I think this is like a real grassroots effort to engage your community. And I think when you engage your community, people are more interested in like community parks and like local trails. And um, I think this is definitely a real sort of grassroots um, effort. Uh, and it definitely has a ripple effect. You know, you invite is really effective um, in this situation, but uh, yeah. I said, our, uh, um, with that, I want to thank everybody for coming to this panel. Jenny and I had no, could not have anticipated that this many people would have been interested in this topic, but we are so glad that to see, and we're so heartened to see so many people in wilderness medicine who are interested in it, or I also want to say austere medicine, military medicine as well, and I acknowledge that. I'm just so glad to see so many people interested in this topic and that we can move, the, we can begin the conversation and kind of brainstorm ways of how we can move forward. So thank you everyone for being here. I just wanna make a final plug that the Wilderness Medicine Society's DIJ committee is putting, on, uh, putting out a survey to discuss the barriers. So we would like, we invite everyone to fill this out. And I think it's really important because this is actually an actionable way that we can learn from our community and see um, how the WMS can move forward um, with strengthening DEIJ. All right. Yeah, thank you, everyone. There was a there was a question in the chat for the panelists about organizations um, or people that they um, would like to share um, for the audience to follow or, or look into. And I think what we'll do is we'll just ask that if there are any organizations or um, or um, individuals that you think uh, would be good to follow and would like to share with the audience, we'll go ahead and send a list out uh, via email with the, um, with the link to the recording. Yeah. But thank you so much everyone for, for joining and thank you to the panelists for, for making this happen. Thank you to the panelists, huge thank you. All right, take care everyone, stay thank safe. You.